This is a phenomenon. This is truly a global university, and I'm honored that you are trusting me as your professor. And in return, I promise that we will deal, continue to deal with the subjects that nobody else deals with and in a way that no one else ever will. You're all paying the BBC if you've got a television, that is. You'll go to prison if you don't, or you're paying through advertising if you're only watching commercial television. Thanks to RT and Sputnik, you're not paying for this at all. Although, we'll be starting next month a midweek mother of all talk shows that you will have to pay one dollar or whatever the sterling equivalent is next month, probably 75 or 76 pence. And that will be the mother of all talk shows truly unleashed, unplugged. Not that we're censored in any way here, but we will be, I don't know, more zany, more edgy, and we'll deal with the very, very sharpest of issues. So if you're one of those watching, please, I urge you now, please share it with everyone, because I quite like it up here on this cloud, as you've probably already inferred. Now, the coronavirus pandemic not only isn't going away, it's coming back. It's coming back in a serious way. Now, that doesn't mean that the death toll that we experienced at one stage in Britain, though we deliberately concealed it, we covered it up, uh, we were losing 1,000 people a day for a period in Britain. Now we're not. And despite the massive spike in cases doubling every week, we will not necessarily go back to that level of death toll, but we might. What if we do? What's going to happen in the economy if we plunge back into general lockdown? Will we even be allowed to go to work? You know my view, as the apocryphal Irishman said when asked directions to Dublin, he said, I wouldn't have started from here. Well, I wouldn't. I told you right from the beginning what we should have been doing and how long we should have been doing it. And the government did very differently. We locked down too late. We lifted the lockdown too early. We did not test and track and trace. We forced people back to work in unsafe conditions. But our economy fell by 20% in one quarter. The biggest single fall since the British economy existed. That fall cannot be afforded again. So what are we going to do now? Everybody knows about the chaos in testing. At least everyone on this side of the Atlantic knows that our government cannot be trusted to go out for a loaf, never mind to safeguard the National Health Service and the public health of 65 million people. You wouldn't trust them to go out to the shops for you. If you were in any doubt about that, uh, then you haven't read the excerpts of Diary of an MP's Wife, which perfectly sums up the caliber of the British political class today. This tome, this diary is serialized everywhere. I'm reading about it everywhere I turn. It's written by the nondescript wife of an entirely nondescript member of parliament, who was an entirely nondescript minister briefly in David Cameron's government. His name is Hugo Swire. I forget his wife's name. Her book spells out the banality, the utter nondescriptness of the people running our country. It can be summed up by her relaying, not denied by David Cameron, that as he took her for a walk with her husband in the gardens of Chequers, the country home of the Prime Minister, 
the Eton and Oxford educated Prime Minister of Great Britain said to his friend's wife, I'd like to take you in those bushes and give you one. Boris Johnson at a number 10 Downing Street dinner, complete with candelabra and white linen and silver spoons, shouted across the table at the aforementioned Shugo Swire, then a minister in the British Foreign Office, God help us. Hey, Shugo, did you shag Jerry Hall? That's the kind of people running our country. That's the kind of people who were running it under David Cameron. It's the kind of people that are running it under Boris Johnson. They all went to the same school. They all went to the same university. They have the same cultural level, which is on ground level, if not on basement level. They all talk to women like that. They all care only about being in power. As another ex-Foreign Office Minister, George Walden, says in the papers today, these people come from such a bubble, such a tiny sliver of the British society that they literally have no idea, which is why they thought Brexit would never pass. They actually have no idea what life looks like, sounds like, is like in the country as a whole. They live their lives from school, through university, and into the professions on a cloud. Uh, but it is a cloud uh, that is about to open. And Britain is about to face economic and political challenges which have not been matched since the summer of 1940, when our brave pilots, together with our Commonwealth and other allied pilots in that battle of Britain saved this country from fascist invasion and being subsumed in the Third Reich of adult Hitler. We have not faced a crisis like that until now. It's not that the coronavirus can be necessarily compared to Hitler. Uh, but it could be if the pandemic were to go up several gears, which it could do, if the economy were to collapse by another 20% in this coming quarter, uh, then the threat to our national life, our livelihood, and the well-being of our people uh, would be existential. The Britain that would come out the other end of that, if there is a coming out at the other end of that, would be almost unthinkable. There could be a collapse of social peace in this country. There could be a revolution in this country. Probably not a good revolution. But the first casualty of it will undoubtedly be Boris Johnson, who is posted missing in dispatches. He is simply not on top of his brief, neither of the economy nor of the public health situation. In fact, he personally has made it far worse. His government handing out a hundred billion pounds or more in public money to private companies who have utterly failed to carry out the projects for which they were paid have put us in this potential disaster now where nobody can get a test, let alone be tested and tracked and traced. We cannot gather in our homes in more than six, but we can sit in a pub with 600, but only till 10 o'clock. We are paid to eat out. Just two weeks ago, if that, eat out to help out which may well have accelerated the spread again of this virus. They're even letting people into rugby games, but not football ones. Limited crowds, but crowds nonetheless. None of this makes any sense, is my point. None of this has any logic. 
And we have a crisis in Britain of numbers, of statistics. Nobody knows whether they can believe the statistics. Nobody knows if they can believe the scientists. Now, all of this is true of Britain, and it's true with knobs on in the United States of America, where anybody who believed the government Anybody who believed the statistics, anybody who believed the science would need their head examined. Uh, this is a state that spent the last four years talking about Russia Gate while their country fell apart and was set on fire, either by global warming in California or by rioters or agent provocateur or a mix of the both in city to shining, burning city. This is a country which is summed up by the contest Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. This is a country that doesn't actually know if this November's election not only can be trusted but will not lead to a civil war, will not lead to the crowd of MAGA supporters on the White House lawn being cut down by the US Marines. This catastrophe of the neoliberal blonde-headed leader scenario is facing both of our countries, Britain and the United States, and in the very, very near future. London might be locked down next week. I might be forbidden by law to come to work. Don't worry about that. We'll find a solution if that were to happen. But the point I'm making is these grave existential challenges are taking place when both of our countries are led by idiots. Chamberlain was a disgrace and a pizza. He was a total miserable failure. But I suspect he was not an idiot. We are led by idiots. And there's no Churchill waiting in the wings in either country. Think about that. I do. I think about it all the time. And lastly, we're going to be talking about cryptocurrency. Now, Max Kaiser is a big friend of mine. So you'd think I'd know everything about cryptocurrency. But actually, everything Max ever told me about it went right over my head. Maybe it did yours also, although Max is on three times a week and has a very big and loyal audience. I'll be talking to an old friend of mine, David Lowe, in Glasgow, who runs a Scottish Bitcoin outfit. We'll talk about that. And he has the view that this could be the answer uh, to a separatist Scotland currency dilemma, whereby the best they can hope for, it seems, is to be like Panama, using American dollars, whilst not controlling them and certainly not being able to print them. All of that is coming up over the next three hours. We'll be talking to the absolutely inimitable Garland Nixon in just a few minutes about all things Americana. But I chose this poll that's out now because I could not believe my eyes last night when the BBC led with the news that a judge that I had never heard of in the United States of America had passed away at the age of 87. In the midst of this economic and public health crisis in Britain, the BBC chose to lead with the death of a woman aged 87 who was a judge, apparently, in a court in America. And so we're asking, why was the death of an American judge a leading item on the BBC? Is it A, she was a liberal, B, to damage Trump, or C, because we have become the 51st state of the United States of America? It's all coming up. Get voting now 
on my Twitter feed at George Galloway. And share, share if you're watching right now, please. I like it up here as the host of the biggest show on the planet.